effect on other types of pressure. School teachers were called on to persuade their students to abandon religious faith. It meant that we needed to seek out the sectarian and show him that our socialist reality was so wonderful that he needed to leave all these dilapidated dogmas and join the ranks of communist builders. During this period, propaganda films designed to discredit Jehovah's Witnesses were distributed throughout the USSR. Slava Isusu. Скажите народам, его царствует. An image of these people was developed, antisocial, miserable, aggressive, maybe not even psychologically normal. Basically, they had no place in society. Whoever has studied persecution in the past has seen that in one way or another, persecution is always built on a lie. The victim is slandered. He must be presented in a way that stirs up prejudice in society. That way society will be on the persecutor's side. Besides using propaganda, for many years the KGB recruited informers to infiltrate witness congregations. For instance, in 1968 the KGB district director offered Nikolai Buitkov an assignment. He requested me to spy on Jehovah's Witnesses. I was asked to find some of their literature and give it to the KGB. Eventually, hundreds of witnesses were printing literature underground. Levko Batich, for example, built his own offset press. Of course, the fear was, what if they catch me? But I didn't think about the consequences much. I hoped that everything would be okay, that Jehovah would bless the work, and that's what happened. The literature had a powerful effect. One witness booklet that compared the teaching of evolution with the Bible changed the KGB informer's viewpoint. No one could answer that question, how life appeared how the universe appeared. And here I am finding a solution. In the Bible I could find answers to those disturbing questions. At the same time I was working for the KGB. I needed to find a way out, because a person cannot ride in two boats at the same time. Witness meetings were a main target of the KGB. But Brichkov reported to his KGB director that he had been unable to find any. Since I couldn't carry out that task, the last time we met, he told me I wasn't suitable for the work. I was so happy because they themselves took me off their list of informers. But greater trouble lay ahead. In 1980, the authorities orchestrated an intense campaign through the mass media to discredit responsible witnesses. In Kparovsk in 1984, Nikolai Buitkov, now a baptized witness, and several fellow believers, were accused of anti-Soviet activities. Wyshkov was charged with taking his sons to Christian meetings and teaching them the Bible. Так вот, я еще раз спрашиваю, 
принимали ли участие в собраниях, тем более незаконных собраниях, несовершеннолетние. Закон Бога, он гласит о том... Речь идет не о нарушении божественных законов, а давайте о нарушении законов наших. Пучков был сентен на три года, но все-таки атака на свидетельство веры вернулась на преследователей. In Germany and in Soviet times, they thought that you could get rid of an idea by using extreme violence. But it turned out that when an idea is strong, it makes people strong. So the outcome was just the opposite of what was expected. In particular, where Jehovah's Witnesses were exiled turned out to be the perfect breeding ground for new supporters. On the local radio, they used to say, these older ones, they will die off by themselves, but this younger generation will never believe in God, never. Well, we see that our grandparents and parents have already died, but we continue on, along with our children and grandchildren. Eventually, many in the government came to realize that the witnesses were not subversive or political. Professor Nikolai Gordienko explains what Soviet authorities concluded from their investigations of Jehovah's Witnesses. It is a specific form of Christianity. It is completely legitimate. The specific character of this religion is its Bible orientation. It consistently tries to follow the concept that the Bible is the only authority. Research in general confirmed that Jehovah's Witnesses are a Russian organization. They are an association of Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians and Moldavians. The 4,000 Witnesses in the Soviet Union in 1946 doubled in number by 1950. By 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev became Communist Party head, their number was approaching 30,000. Gorbachev's policy of perestroika led to greatly increased freedoms across the Soviet Union. In 1989, a long-withheld privilege was granted to the witnesses. Large numbers were permitted to leave the country to attend conventions with their fellow believers elsewhere. We had only heard that there were conventions. We didn't even dream of going. And all of a sudden we were going to a convention in Warsaw, Poland. I couldn't believe it. I said, you know, Fyodor, until we get to Warsaw, I won't believe that such freedom has opened up. When we came in, I looked. It was like a river, a river of people flowing toward the stadium. As soon as the music began to play, I started to cry. In March 1991, Jehovah's Witnesses were legally registered in Russia. That summer saw the first series of conventions inside the Soviet Union. In former times, whenever our brothers were in the company of the police, it was when they were being arrested. But now, the police were escorting 11 busloads from Irkutsk, bearing the banner, Jehovah's Witnesses Convention. Long-time witnesses such as Konstantin Skripchuk, who spent 23 years in confinement for his faith, especially appreciated these changes. Skripchuk and other imprisoned witnesses were completely exonerated they received documents of rehabilitation giving them benefits similar to war veterans. A KGB officer decided that he wanted to speak with me one more time. He said, for all that Soviet rule did to you, you should hate it to the core, but I don't see that in you. Please tell me, how is that possible? I said, it is totally possible. If I hated the government, or even opposed it somehow, then I would not be a Christian. Siberia is no longer the forbidding place it once was. 
With development, life has become less challenging. Irkutsk, Siberia is now a bustling modern city. Today, more than 300,000 of Jehovah's Witnesses carry on their spiritual activity in all the countries of the former Soviet Union. The headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia is located near St. Petersburg. For the Witnesses who had to operate underground, having their own center open to the public is a dream come true. In many ways, life is more normal now for Jehovah's Witnesses. They are grateful to enjoy their family life and worship in freedom. Their hard experiences have strengthened their faith. Nowadays, thinking about what I've gone through, I cannot imagine that I could have done it in my own strength. A Bible prophecy says, they will be certain to fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. I am thankful to Jehovah that He does not leave His people. My heart is full of joy. It almost doesn't fit inside my chest when I think for what I suffered, for what I was punished, that I tried to do the will of Jehovah. I think it is frightening only if you've never faced difficulties. But once you face them, you know that special strength. When we rely on Jehovah, we ask for His guidance, we ask for His help. We will always get it. Jehovah's Witnesses look to the future with the same faith as they have shown in the past. In their view, it was this faith that brought them through their trials. Yeah.